open the session tonight with um, the awards and recognition, correct? All right. Dr. Dixon, awards and recognition. Good evening, everyone. So first tonight, we're here to recognize and celebrate our dedicated staff through the district who have achieved tenure or continuing contract status. So here with us tonight to recognize the staff members, I'd like to call up Dr. Paul Lombardo, who is our Assistant Superintendent of HR and Operations. And Paul, I hand this significant recognition over to you. Good evening, everyone. My pleasure this evening to introduce teachers from our district recommended to the Board of Education for their completion of requirements towards tenure. A teacher or certified support staff initially licensed before January 1, 2011, continuing contract eligibility is met if they've had three years experience in the, in the district or received tenure in a previous district and two years of service. They must have a master's degree or 30 hours beyond their bachelor's degree and they must have a professional or permanent license. Um, this year, anyone after January 1st, 2011, uh, there are other eligibility requirements to meet, and that holds a professional or senior professional lead license, has held an educator's license for at least seven years, and has completed either of the following, that they received 30 semester hours of coursework in their licensure, or they held a master's degree at the time of initially being licensed and six semester hours after. Um, before I introduce the staff, I want to thank people who helped this event. We do have food here, and uh, please help yourself throughout uh, and afterwards the board meeting. But Kathan and our communications department for creating the programs and certificates, uh, AVI for food refreshments, and Marissa in HR, she helped organize the entire event. Can we give them a round of applause, please? So the program has nine staff members who have been granted tenure. I'll be introducing those staff members that were able to make it tonight. And as you uh, hear your name, please come up front and get your certificate. And please stand in front so that we can uh, take a picture afterwards. And please hold your applause until I'm done reading all the names. Okay. So the first person is Tracy Adeen, Fairfax Elementary School, second grade teacher. Joined the district in 2011 bachelor's degree from University of Cincinnati, and master's degree from Notre Dame College. Yeah, just clap. It's better if you clap during that time. So forget what I said prior, prior to that. Really, that was better. Benjamin Ammon, Heights High School, instrumental music teacher, joined the district in 2011, bachelor's of music, Cleveland Institute of Music, Master's in Music, Youngstown State, and a Master's from American College of Education. Odisha Blue, Heights High School Science Teacher, joined the district in 2012, Bachelor's from Xavier University, and Master's Degree from The Ohio State University. Amy Coleman, Boulevard Fairfax, speech language pathologist, joined the district in 2016, bachelor's degree from Kent State University and master's from Kent State University. Jessica Hagman, Heights High School math teacher, joined the district in 2006, bachelor's degree John Carroll University and master's from Walden University. Michelle Manolio, Garrity Professional Development School, fifth grade teacher, joined the district in 2015, bachelor's degree from Ursuline College. Sarah Parker, Heights High School marketing teacher, joined the district in 2015, bachelor's degree from Boeing Green State University, and master's from Ashland University. Uh, Melinda Stoikoy, Fairfax Elementary School, guidance counselor, joined the district in 2012, Bachelor's degree, Baldwin Wallace, and Master's from Cleveland State University. And Tracy Terrell, Noble Elementary School, fifth grade teacher, joined the district. Joined the district in 2007, bachelor's degree from Drexel University, and Master's from Cleveland State University. 
So let's give all of them a, a nice round of applause. Congratulations, everyone. Okay, so for our final recognitions, we would like to recognize our CHUH staff members who are going above and beyond to create a culture of excellence in our district. Tonight, I want to honor our Tiger Team members for the month of April. We've received more than 300 total nominations since we began this program last October, and we have several of the April honorees here with us tonight. So when I read your name, please come forward. So from Heights High, we have criminal justice teacher Johnny Lemons and principal Dr. Brian Williams. <laughs> from Monticello at Heights Middle School, we have school, school psychologist Michelle Sacconi. Is Michelle here? From Roxborough at Heights Middle School, we have media specialist Joellen Dink. <laughs> From Boulevard Elementary School, special ed educational aide Fred James. <laughs> From Canterbury Elementary School, assistant custodian Natalie Davis. <laughs> she's, oh, she's working, George has shared that. Um, from Fairfax Elementary School, Intervention Specialist, Rochelle Klein. From Garrity Professional Development School, Principal Katrina Hicks. From Noble Elementary School, Music Teacher, Daniel Hirschman Rossi. <laughs> From Oxford Elementary School, fifth grade teacher Katie Merrick. It's Katie here. She's probably with those twins. From Roxborough Elementary School, second grade teacher Malik Daniels. And from the Board of Education, IT infrastructure specialist Mark Brown. So congratulations to all of our honorees and thank you for all your efforts in promoting a culture of excellence in Cleveland Heights University Heights. So before we end our recognition, I'd like to have our two high school students, if they would come up each month, we started um, having two of our high school students would come up and give us a report with what's happening at our high school. So if I have the students come up and they can introduce themselves to you and tell us what's happening at Heights High. Um, hello, I'm Devon Benet. Uh, Heights Library, Lee Road Library is partnering with the Cleveland Heights University Heights School District Visual Arts Department to host a creative um, district-wide art show at Lee Road Library. And it's from April 17th to May 18th. And it's a combined art show of all of the schools and all of the art classes 
um, art that was chosen by the art teachers. So from all the way from kindergarten to the 12th grade. And it has pretty much anything, photography, sculpting, metals, uh, paper mache, chalk, drawing, painting, all that. And it will be judged by a district of art, by the art teachers and will be judged by uh, the, a jury of community artists and awards for first place, second and third will be mentioned later. Hello, I'm Caroline Imka. Um, the Cleveland Heights Vocal Music Department is having their spring concert on May 11th at seven o'clock here in the Cleveland Heights Auditorium. Um, be sure to come out and hear our seniors sing their senior solos, it's a big deal. Um, and the announcement for next year's musical is at the end. It's very exciting. Um, also this month, throughout the month, students have been taking Ohio State tests. Um, the last test is actually tomorrow. <laughs> it's very exciting. Um, the school has been offering a lot of like prep days and preparation for the students, which is really helpful this year. Also, um, we're under a new system. Um, the test is split up into two separate days, part one and part two, which allows students to go to all their regularly scheduled classes, as per usual, just a little shorter. Thank you. So thank you to those two students. I know it takes a lot of courage to come up in front of the board every week, but they've been doing a fantastic job, so thank you. And congratulations to all the honorees tonight. You continue to make us proud, and we talk about a culture of excellence. You definitely all define what that means. So congratulations um, to all of you. And from our board president, who's not here tonight, um, he wanted me to make sure that I said congratulations um, from him to you. So thank you. So that ends the our recognitions portion, and then we can go to, um, a statement from the audience. Unless people All want right. to leave. You want to if, um, if anybody needs to leave, it is perfectly fine. We understand it's a long night, especially if you're a student who has to take your last test tomorrow. So. But once again, congratulations to all of our award winners tonight. And if you are staying, please feel free to um, avail yourself of the snacks that are here. So um, I see we have one person who has signed up to speak. Is there anyone else who wants to speak this evening? If so, come and get the clipboard. Otherwise, uh, Charles Drake, please come forward and we'll hear your remarks. <clears throat> Can I close this? No, just sit down. Oh. Let me put it here. Let me go like this. Sorry. Oh, there we go. I'll put Thank it back you. up when you're done. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, Superintendent Dixon, members of the Board of Education, my name is Charles C. Drake. I am a resident of the great independent nation of Cleveland Heights since August of 1969, except for three years. As a, for, as a former single dad, I raised three beautiful daughters and raised another one with my wife of 30 plus years. I graduated from Cleveland Heights High School in 1970 but didn't learn much in that year, except that my parents realized that they should have had me stay back in New Jersey and complete my education. On Friday, April 20th, I drove by the overpriced and overbudgeted edifice that you, conduct, that you constructed on the corners of Lee and Cedar, the building we're in now, and observed that the American flag in the courtyard was flying at full mast. I called the board office to ask why and re requested to speak to Superintendent Dixon. After waiting 15 plus minutes, I was told she was not available and what was the subject of my call. Why well, I informed the person that it was a question of why the American flag was not flying at half staff. I was told it was yesterday for the killings years ago in Columbine, which surprised me. I stated I wanted to know why this district was not following the directive of our president, Donald J. Trump. 
I know most of the board members are Democrats, but he is the lawful president and issued a directive that all the American flags be flown at half-mast in honor of former First Lady Barbara Bush until Saturday the 21st at sunset. I was told to call the high school, and that was the maze. What unit was my child in, etc. I hope the individual who gave me the erroneous information was not previously educated by this district but that's probably not the case. I have a visual aid I would like to give each board member, if I may. This photo has two issues in it. This photo was taken on the 20th in the evening. Do, you, do any of the board members see anything amiss with that photo? No. No, you failed. One, the flag is not flying at half mast. Two, that picture was taken close to sunset, and the flag that was flying after sunset should have a light shining on it. Apparently, the board saw fit to use dollars for the renovation of the football field before they discussed such important building issues as the type of brick and windows, but could not budget to respectfully have our American flag lit. Remember, voters were promised that the renovations would be done with donated dollars, not tax bond issue dollars. I respectfully request each board member write a thousand word paper on proper United States flag etiquette and have it published in your monthly mouthpiece, the Heights Observer, in the June issue. I doubt that that will be done or that these comments will be reported. It is more important that the children of this district learn that Susie has two mommies and Daddy has two daddies instead of United States history and proper flag respect. But you can walk out of class to protest Columbine, but not to respect this great nation. I am glad my wife and I sacrificed to educate our last daughter not in this system, which continually receives a D or an F on your state report card. As an aside, I am not a military, former military member. And also, when I drove to the wrong location, I see you have a flag flying on Monticello Junior High, and on Saturday night, uh, April 21st, about 8 o'clock at night, my wife and I drove by Monticello Junior High and saw the flag flying at full mast, not being lit. Thank you. Thank you for your remarks, Mr. Drake. I appreciate you coming and giving us your opinion. Are there any other comments from the audience? Anybody else want to speak tonight? Okay. We're going to move on to our um, cons consent agenda, the approval of the consent agenda. Mine won't advance, <laughs> so I can't tell what items are on the consent agenda. Consent agenda covers items uh, D, the meeting minutes, E, personnel, business services, item G, and um, item H, finance. And for those of you who aren't aware, we use a, a consent agenda to um, approve things that are kind of regular that come up every month. Um, we board members read it, but it's a way to ensure that the meetings move timely and we can get on to other business as well. So do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved. Second. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Ms. Wright? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. All right. So that covered item D, E, 
G and H, so we need to go to item F, which is educational services. And that is the career and technical education presentation. So Brad, will you please come forward? Thank you. Just pick it back up, George, set it back up on top? Okay. We can do this, career tech. We can do this. Technology. Perfect, thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. I don't like being bound to this, so I'm going to try my best to stay because I know it is Mike, but I might wander a bit, and I apologize in advance for those of you, Alan, who have trouble hearing me at times. Um, before we get started, we talked a lot about educational growth and about education and how we use acronyms and things like that all the time. Career Tech uses more acronyms than anybody but the military. <laughs> yep. We use a lot of them, and you're going to hear a lot of them in the presentation. So to prepare you for that, I've got a list. All right. This is uh, some of the common acronyms for Career Tech that I've picked up over the last uh, almost 20 years of working at Career Tech. Now, <laughs> I don't expect you Thank to you. be able to memorize all of these, but this is going to help you reference things in the future. Now, to make sure that everyone is attending, oh my. all of these acronyms I'm going to use, we're going to play a little bingo. It's called Career Tech. Acronym bingo. <laughs> so I'm going to give you each a card, and there will be a career tech focus prize at the end for those who have to get bingo. Now, please don't yell during the presentation unless you get excited. But again, these acronyms are a way of keeping things moving along as we go through uh, the presentation. Career tech has been part of the. No, no, no. No, no. Part of the last. Oh, yeah. I for the last. No, no. Oh, man. <laughs> oh, everybody, everybody should have one. No pressure. Approximately the last 60 years, in fact, before, it used to be called vocational education. How many remember that? Vocational right. education. It was VoTech. And it was in every high school. It was in comprehensives. It was in career tech centers. It was about preparing students with the trades. Things have evolved since then. And we're going to talk tonight a little bit about how we've evolved along with that. Career Tech has been a focus of, of the, the five-year strategic plan, and it fits really well into these five goals. And I've sort of segmented tonight's presentation into these five goals, and I hope you can follow along and see how this sort of weaves its way throughout all of what we do. But I want you to keep one thing in mind. Career Tech, by any name, is about opportunity. It's about giving students a chance to maybe explore a career they never considered, to develop a new skill that they may make into a vocation, but they may just use it later in life. So keep that in mind and think about how these pieces fit within the whole the, uh, of the strategic plan. We've expanded our Career Tech Consortium in the last year. In 1617, we had three districts in our consortium, 13 programs at two sites. It was Warrensville and Cleveland Heights. Shaker was part of this, but Shaker doesn't house any programs at all. These 13 programs were successful, but we had an opportunity with some of our neighboring districts to build, again, some more opportunity. And, and Dr. Dixon and I spoke uh, with the other superintendents, and she facilitated us being able to, to move together and combine our efforts. And so now we're offering 31 programs at four different sites. And we're going to expand, hopefully, to the fifth site very shortly. 31 programs, more than double. Some of those are duplicates, as you'll see in a second. But we have pathways in 12, we have 12 different pathways. The state of Ohio broke career pathways down into a total of 16, one of which has no programs offered in it anywhere in the state, so actually 15. We don't have any agricultural-based programs. So take that's 14. So we have hit the 12 big areas. And the bold face print up there are the pathways. Underneath are each of the programs. There's kind of a little key there on where the programs fall and the buildings they are, CHUH, obviously, that's us. You've got MH for Maple Heights, WH, Warrensville Heights, Bedford, we spelled out. 
And if you look through this, it's very comprehensive. The opportunities our students have are amazing. There's something here for everyone. And it doesn't mean that you are going to end up being a firefighter, but it does mean that you get a chance to learn how to save somebody's life as an EMT, how to be able to give first aid. You may not be Dr. Dre when you walk out of audio engineering, but the venues, the live venues around here, having watched tonight's guys set up, it is truly a science and an art to mic a room and mic a live performance. And our students are learning how to do that in demand. Criminal justice, our program. Commander Lemons was recognized tonight. Every single one of his seniors earned their OPADA, it's in your sheet, <laughs> Ohio <laughs> Police Academy training. Earned their certificate, OPADA. Our reality right now, this is, I tried to think of a visual way to represent how we teach career tech now and where we are sort of going. And I came up with these bubbles. And there's, again, the idea is that these bubbles, our students are the star in the center because they are stars. And the idea was that they have an equal opportunity with each one of these areas to be able to grow. Right now, it looks like classroom instruction is the larger. We have experiential learning opportunities, the next size. And then CTSO, that stands for Career Technical Student Organizations, CTSO. Those are about leadership and competition. Oh, by the way, let me just digress for a moment about competition and CTSO. I have two trophies here. This trophy. You may not like Going to nationals. So again, CTSOs do matter. Right now, we, uh, this is where we are, second year of HOSA participation. HOSA, Health Occupational Student Association, HOSA, it's a, those who are going into nursing, uh, pharmacy technician, sports medicine, it's a competition. And they go and they participate, and we had two students go to nationals last year. Um, We've had success at regionals. 12 students qualified for the state competition this year. DECA, DCA, which is mm -hmm. First Flight Education, which is marketing, that's their club. They uh, have been to nationals the past three years. And uh, we've participated in local and regional film festivals with our digital video. We have been given an opportunity to shoot some video for a community group. Um, that's going to be making a, a video similar to uh, Voices from the Hill, I think it was. Um, and so, it'll be 
what voices and heights, whatever. So our, our kids are going to be doing that kind of thing. So we're also part of cybersecurity, which uh, was on Channel 8 the other day, uh, where we were recognized for our participation. We compete against teams all over the country, and we were one of only two public high schools in this area that are doing that. The robotics competition, we talked about that. So CTSOs has a small role right now. It doesn't seem like, but it's, it's, it's got to get bigger because it's about leadership and about opportunity. Right now, we're looking at uh, some project-based active learning stuff driven by state and industry standards. We don't just have to respond to career tech to uh, what the state says, you know, these are the important things you need to learn. We have to be responsive to industry as well. For example, uh, Mr. Jeff Porter, who teaches uh, automotive technology over at Delisle, brand new, beautiful facility. I love it. Thank you so much, community, for again building that so we can send out the next job, the next technicians. Having seen these kids work, I'm glad they're the ones fixing my brakes. Give me a mic. Oh, look at this. This one has to do it. Thank you. I don't know how it works. Check one. Oh. <laughs> Talk into it. Thank you, George. <laughs> and so, uh, Mr. Porter, again, these are the kids I want working on my own car. I mean, if you need an oil check, come, come down and see us over July. It's a beautiful facility. If nothing else, check and see it. Thank you to the community for that. We're looking at our web exam data. It just, just became available. We're ahead of the pace. We've got a couple of kids that are still needing to take the test. Those are our end of course exams. Those are just like the state's testing for everything else. And in fact, if you pass all of those as a senior, that is a pathway to graduation as well. We're looking at FFA, that is Firefighters Academy, not the Future Farmers of America. <laughs> not here. I think urban agriculture would fit here, but that's not what that stands for. Certificate test in May. And I already talked to you about OPADA and about how the students there uh, are garnering up to 22 college credits for what they do. Experiential learning. We do real world stuff, real world laboratory things. I mean, I don't know how many times I, I've walked past a lab and gone, wow, that's cool. What is that? And I stick my head in. You see them going, they're doing the actual things. Whether If you're in clinical health careers, they're up there, they're like measuring the circumference of the baby's head and they're taking the pulses and, and the length and doing all the conversion factors and charting and they've got the beds and they're doing all of those things. You go to farm tech, they're, they're actually sorting and we've got, a, we've got a, actually a, a pharmacy up there. It has no drugs in it, but all the boxes, it's a fully outfitted pharmacy. And they practice filling prescriptions. They use the exact same software that's used in the industry. They're ready to go when they graduate. We have a lot of very real things going on. Our compliance items. This year, again, we required to do a lot of compliance things. We must have bilateral articulation agreements. That means bilateral means that we have an agreement with an institution, a post-secondary institution, for college credits. We're required by the state to have these agreements in place. We have them in place for all of our programs. Our primary partner is Tri-C, Stark State, Kent State, and uh, Bryant Stratton right now. And we're expanding actually further south and looking at a few other larger schools, uh, the University of Akron and Lake Erie College for our teacher academy programs. So this is why this matters. This is why we continue to expand. The state of Ohio has said career tech is important because it's about opportunity. I've said the most, the most powerful person in the state of Ohio is not the governor. It's the director of work, the workforce development, a man named Ryan Burgess. And he's been driving a lot of what goes on, not only in, in, in career tech, but also uh, in the state as well. And the state is, again, beginning to grow because they're focusing a lot on this. These are careers that have a real end to them. And if our goal is to make our students college and career ready, our goal is to make our students career ready. Because that's the goal. I don't want anyone in college the rest of their life. It's expensive. It's an important step. But you don't want to stay there. So we're making them career ready. And that career step may include a four-year college. It may include six years. It may include trade school. It may include the U.S. military. It may include a lot of different options. It may be going directly to an apprenticeship. But again, if these things aren't out there, our students don't have the opportunity to know what they don't know. Last year, our current school year, 17-18, uh, Bedford has 201 students in six programs. This is basically just the stats stuff. 
Um, we have 732 and 12 programs. These are on site. This, the programs are housed physically with us. Uh, FCS, Family and Consumer Science. CBI, Career-Based Intervention, and CVEC is, uh, um, again, a placement for our students uh, who are special needs, who have some specific, need of a specific skill set. And uh, we've been doing a lot to try and move our students through this continuum and see that they can be served here, but a lot of it is reaching out and making sure that we have them in the right place. 318 PNC, that is participants and concentrators. In Career Tech, we have both participants and concentrator. Participants are those who have at least enrolled in one class. Concentrators are those who have enrolled in the third course. There are four courses at a minimum for a pathway. We have 285 in FCS and OOD, that is not the OOD that you're normally used to, that's out of district. 129 out of district are currently attending here. 129 out of district students come here. We have school buses rolling in all hours of the day. And they're being served here. Maple Heights has 168 students in seven programs housed on their, their site. Uh, Shaker doesn't have any programs right now, so zero, zero. They are working to get another program, probably something in the performing arts area. They've discussed that, but again, that's a local decision. And Warrensville Heights has 54 in three programs. 1,100, almost 1,200 students, high school students, are participating in career technical education in some way, shape, or form. Predicted growth for 1819. We had a career tech fair, it was very successful. I think we're going to change how we do it next year after looking at some of our data. I think we want to move it to the evening so we can showcase it for the community as well. I think that makes sense. We have an online application with teacher and school counselor access to see who has applied. Because some of the programs are competitive. We had uh, 68 students apply for um, less than 50 slots in health careers. And so it, it is competitive. Uh, we've done direct recruiting mailers, teacher postcards during the summer, and we've seen a 29% increase over the same period of time last year in the juniors that apply. And again, that's had some unintended consequences. Like I said, we have some programs that are oversubscribed, but every student had to put down two choices, and if they didn't get their first choice, we tried to put them in the second choice. If they didn't like their second choice, I found them a third choice. The idea, again, is to find something that they want to explore and try. They're not stuck in there. Not stuck for two years. Some of the programs require that commitment, but it's a good place to be to have more than you do slots. But it's open conversations with some of our other districts. I had a conversation this morning with one of our districts about starting another health program to allow us to absorb all those students. And we can fill 75 students in any health program without even trying hard. Career Tech is funded. How's it funded? Well, it costs a little bit more to educate a student who is in auto tech than it does someone who is in an English class, for example. Um, the equipment's expensive. The Hunter alignment machine, $65,000. The racks, ten dollars to $15,000 a piece. If you've ever gone and just bought yourself a set of screwdrivers, you understand. It's expensive. And the state has made allowances for this. In fact, we, they use a program called weighted funding where they have decided that certain career tech programs, because they cost so much, those that are heavy trades, cost more. And so you get a little bit more. Now, some of those stipends are over $5,000 per kid. Wow, that's huge. Remember though, that's, we only get a percentage of that based on the number of periods we have them in, in class. So uh, it sounds like a lot of money, but it's, it's not. So I do appreciate uh, the fiscal department that every time I've gone and I said, hey, we need can we? Mr. Gaynor and his people have been great about getting us what we need to move forward. So I, I do appreciate that. Um, we also get federal money called Perkins money. Anyone know what Car Carl Perkins Act? Anyone ever heard of the Carl Perkins Act? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Carl Perkins is about vocational education. It's about providing additional funds. We get approximately a quarter million dollars a year of vocational funding. It can only be spent a certain way. There's only a few allowable ways it can be spent, and, and uh, Sue Pardee in our federal grants does a great job managing that. And so, again, you, I don't know if you, when, I, when I'm talking about these people, I'm saying it, this is about all of us. We all provide these opportunities for our students. It's not just 
career tech, it's not just the career tech teachers, it's about the whole organization is, is part of what we're doing. So that's a, that's a big piece of it. The rule for Perkins, easiest rule, it's to supplement what you're already doing, not to supplant it. Meaning that you, if you're already doing something really well and you need to bolster it and build it up, and you need to buy a piece of equipment that may cost $100,000, that's what it's there for. It's there to make sure the opportunities continue, that once you establish something, it, it remains established. At the end of the day, that which is funded is measured, and that which is measured is funded. It's a simple reality. We live in a data-rich world, and because of that, we need to make certain that we are pursuing those things that make the most sense for the most kids for the right reasons. And one of the biggest capital outlays that we invest in is the professional development of, of our career tech teachers. I need to uh, thank um, the Ed Services people for allowing career tech to be able to design professional development that is career tech focused and that, that fits that unique program needs. And this, this coming summer, we're going to be um, doing some very intensive development um, at, the, at the state conference for the first time as a group. If you want to know more about the data and how the data has changed, the uh, data department has a couple of, a couple of presentations to all of you. Ms. Bird has done a fan fantastic job. Uh, there's a link to an another presentation we did. Again, it's a little, it's essentially her information, but it's got a couple of career tech twists to it because there's a little different way of counting things in our report card. What is our reality then? Look, oh look, the bubbles are more balanced. That's good. That's what we want next year to look like. That's, that's, our, that's our goal to look like that, where we look at our CTSOs. 100% participation, local and regional events. 100% participation. Every student gets a chance to do a local contest at the very least. Establish a local Skills USA chapter, including required meetings and, and uh, officer chapters. And that would mean a supplemental would be needed for CTSO advisor to oversee Skills USA, HOSA, DECA, BPA, FTA. FDA's Future Teachers of America. There's a whole bunch of those on your cards. You quit playing along, didn't you? You did. We want to increase the experiential learning, lab or place of business. 100% of those CTE concentrators, those who have started their third course, concentrators, those are your seniors, except with engineering that might be a junior. 100% will have an opportunity to experience learning opportunities outside the classroom or the lab. That means they'll be going on some sort of field experience. Right now we have some students who do go out. Uh, for example, Mr. Porter has all but one of his seniors currently out in placement, which means they are working. And they're learning in a real world, real shop environment. Our marketing kids are out learning in a real world environment, a retail environment. All the programs will give students that. And that can be something like an externship, an internship. Uh, we do a lot of externships with um, our IT. Mr. Tabai, we go to Progressive. We do a couple of different things like that. Um, I get phone calls every week from organizations saying, do you have? Yes, I do. Let me give you the name of the teacher in the email. All programs will have industry-recognized credentials. This is important. That's a pathway to graduation. I heard today from our clinical health teacher, we now have eight of our students have passed their STNA. That's awesome, STNA. Again, that means they can go work. OPADA, 100% of Commander Lemon's classes passed. We've got our pharmacy tech students getting ready to take their exam. For the first time, they're now allowed to take it before they graduate. Cosmetology students just finished their mock state boards in preparation for taking the cosmetology state board exam. They're all getting ready. And this is in addition to all of their end of course testing to do for career tech and anything they have to do for their academics. 100% of our concentrators will take the work keys 2.0, which means they will take the work keys in preparation for a graduation pathway if they go the industry credential route. It's just to get them ready, collect the data set. We're going to begin to implement CTE-wide use of AVID strategies. I don't remember what AVID is. We've talked about AVID. We've got an AVID presentation. AVID is huge. 
and it makes sense. Those of you who don't know, you'll have to wait for Mr. Swagger to share on that. But 100% of the CT teachers are going to begin using these strategies for note taking for all of the procedures they do. So it looks the same when they're doing those kind of things as it does in their academic class. So we get some real consistency across the board. Naviance is going to provide the core for our career planning. We're doing a lot more with career planning from grade six. And this is going to be, again, rolled out heavily with uh, our juniors next year as we begin to look at helping them create their resumes, build their portfolios, and get those practical pieces down and out of the way. And then we're looking at planning academy models and so on and so forth. It's all there. Everyone knows how to read. If you want more details on that, I can talk for another half an hour. But how does this line up with our strategic goals? Each one of these, we came up with a whole list of things that we posted on our website, which, by the way, we have a new website if anyone's interested. And I thank Mr. Wartman for his assistance with that. And that is heightscareertech.org. 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 Again. Dot com. And we're getting ready to uh, look at that. What's that? Dot com. Dot com. Well, not dot com. Is it dot com? Dot org. Dot com. Forget that. Why didn't you tell me that? <laughs> Sorry, it's dot com. Forget everything I just said for the last minute and a half. Heightscareertech.com. Um, and I'd like to thank him also because we're working through a branding campaign and we're looking at some of the things. I'm not going to ask you to read all these. I'm not going to read them. But those are our goals. Those will all be on our website. And as we get through those, we're going to begin to identify how we're doing that, our action strategies, those kind of things. So that will all be available for everyone to go back and, and read in depth. I know board members, you've had a chance to look at all these in advance. So strategic goal two, summer school, one week exploratory. We've got seven teachers. I just want to talk about this one. We're going to be offering uh, exploratory career tech stuff to middle school students for four days, I think, four days. And it ranges from pharmacy tech, uh, they're going to look at, you know, mixing and things like that. Auto tech, they're going to do some simple engines and some machines type stuff. They're going to learn to, and health science, they're going to learn blood pressure and, and vital science and those kind of things. And first aid and some things that will be very practical. So again, looking at increasing CTSO as well. Three. Eventually, we'd like to look at developing adult education programming in conjunction with our other partners. This is providing opportunities for our adults in the community to be able to expand their skill set. Something as simple as possibly adult education for the STNA. Or to be able to learn, if you wanted to learn about how to change your oil, those kind of things, basic auto maintenance. Things that make sense and from a practical standpoint for our community. That's Mr. Porter, by the way. He does a phenomenal job. Um, we're looking at combining five districts. It, that's a, it, it is a challenge to work with five different districts. We all have a different flavor. We all have a different way of doing things. But I really need to commend um, Dr. Dixon and, and, and her, her cohorts, who obviously are not here. They have their own meetings. Um, but they came together and, and helped with working out and smoothing out a lot of the details about how this was going to work. And, and it's... It's moving along. It's moving along. It's going to take a few years to get all the bugs worked out, but we are making phenomenal progress. And I'm just happy that we're able to, to offer opportunities. Again, like I said, we have students from Maple coming here, Bedford coming here, Warrensville, and Shaker every single day. And our students are going over there. So, you know, it's, it's, it's about, again, this, this larger sense of community, about strengthening uh, our first ring, about strengthening Cuyahoga County, about building again, connections and networking for the future. Again, Career Tech is going to focus on their professional development, looking at um, some of the options or the IBCP. Anyone know what IBCP stands for? IBCP, International Baccalaureate Career Program. And it is, actu it is actually a career-based flavor of our National Baccalaureate. Yes. And it's a good jump off point because it requires us to get the core classes down. But it's for those students who want that IB experience within a career tech program. <coughs> and, it, and it's a good place, to, again, to start that flavor. Let's 
Strategic plan goal number five. Look at optimizing our existing spaces, finding the best way to use the space we have collectively and collaboratively. And it might be that students uh, spend part of their day in a math class when they're in engineering. They might spend part of their day um, with Mr. Nachman. Again, it's looking for those creative uses of the space we have and create a five-year plan that reflects the use of the monies that are given to us um, in a very responsible and uh, fiscally sound way. Questions or comments? Again, career tech is something I'm passionate about. I love career tech. I love education, but I love career tech because it saved me. I have a question. So. Um, can you explain, so there's, let's say in the, um, in the, the pharmacy program, there may be 15 spots and we have built a consortium now of perhaps five districts. How do we decide uh, how many of those spots go to each district and is it uh, reciprocal or how is that determined? There's actually, the MOU spells that out very specifically and, and when we worked on, we spent a lot of conversation around that and uh, there's a mathematical formula but more importantly there is uh, a need to, and it was not that the, the spots would um, be filled up is that they would not be filled up. That was the concern. So there is a certain number of spots available to each district within each program, but the concern was that, you know, there would be seats being held open when they could be filled by a local student. So there is a time period, and it's and after the 1st of, of May, sorry, after the 15th of April, rather, there's the time slot, then the slot reverts back to that district. So, but every district has the opportunity to put kids into the program, and we try to make sure things are, are balanced, as balanced as possible. And, we try to, and we're keeping kids cohorted together, like we wouldn't split Warrensville kids up like send half to one auto tech program, half to another auto tech program. They would all stay together. Excellent. It's a logistical struggle. Um, but I, I, I need, again, to talk about the transportation people in all five districts have been great. You know, we're on the phone with them all the time about kids being picked up and dropped off, and, and that's, again, that's, that's crazy because usually they're short-staffed they're short anyway. How did um, the scheduling get affected by our weird schedule for state tests the past few weeks? You didn't even want to toss me a softball, did you? No. Um, the testing schedule... Oh, bingo, by yes, the way. Yes, you're welcome. Uh, I have it, too. <laughs> the, the testing schedule impacted everybody. It impacted everyone's time, and, and to say it impacted career tech any more than anyone else would be an unfair, unfair statement. Um, we did make some adjustments in that career tech teachers were permitted to be able to hold their career tech classes in the morning, those specifically with hours like cosmetology or um, those that were tied to a minimum standard of hours. But again, they were allowed to be able to do that, but that schedule impacted everyone. Do the other districts have the same um, I guess grid for the state tests that we had? No, and that's one of the challenges that, that, that Dr. Dixon is aware of and that, um, you know, as they sit down and talk in their meetings toward the end of the year, um, that's one of the topics of conversation will be how testing is handled to minimize the impact on all of our students. And then presumably we're also balancing schedules in five high schools. That is another struggle. Again, uh, we have one that starts at 8 o'clock and uh, one that starts at 7.45. Um, there, there are some challenges. Again, logistically, it's one of, that's the biggest challenge. We have, for example, Warrensville does start at, at zero at 8 o'clock, but uh, they don't start their career tech until their second period. Hmm. So Ouch. it works out well for, for, for our students to be able to transport, but again, you've got to remember there's going to be some time lost in transport and those kind of things. And those are logistical things that I think, as you know, I said, it would take several years to get a lot of this ironed out, and I think that will come in time. But remember, at the end of the day, we're still dealing with, um, again, five unique entities with, which have five negotiated agreements and, and, and five um, priorities in place that uh, they need to make sure they adhere to. And the last annoying question, a number of years ago there was difficulty with transportation because kids were missing lunch. Mm -hmm. Have we managed to No one misses lunch. That? No one misses lunch. Good. In fact, no one misses breakfast. Shaker kids eat here. 
They come, they come here in the morning. They, they do. They come here because they want breakfast? Well, they, they come here because they, they have to leave their building, you know, earlier, and so they're not getting breakfast over there, so we serve them here. Okay. Good. Good. So, Brad, I have a question. You um, mentioned that there was going to – there's a summer school – exploratory program for the middle school students. Can you talk about that? Is that starting this summer? Yeah, it'll be this summer. It'll be the first week of June, and we're getting it fleshed out. I had to talk to the teachers today to find out what supplies they needed to make sure we were able to fund it. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that's going to be this year. It's going to be the four days immediately after school ends. Okay. Monday, and Tuesday, has Wednesday. that been communicated yet to students? This is it the first will be. I've heard no, of it. It's, it's not. Okay. It's going to be communicated in the next two weeks. Okay, great. Thank yeah. you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Anyone have bingo? I have we bingo, have but you had also mentioned at the beginning that there were five schools in the consortium. Yes. And Shaker has zero in zero programs. Zero kids on their site, yes. Oh, on their site. Right. Okay, those, but they're in our, yes. in yes. the four other sites. Correct. And they're looking to add a program That was to their conversation that, that was had with the prior administration, yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So Shaker will, we, we First of all, I want to say thank you to Brad. When we started this journey of um, expanding the consortium, he just kind of stared at me like, we're going to do what? And I said, we're going to expand our opportunities for our kids. And um, we're the lead district, and he is the person that's coordinated for, the, the, for all of us. So his leadership uh, in this project uh, is to be commendable as we continue to um, I think we're going to dominate in this field. We're going to get some more people to come on board. But I think it's important if we go back to strategic plan number two and making sure we're offering opportunities to our students. And this was a way that we could do it in a coordinated fashion. And Shaker, we've told Shaker that they have to put some skin in the game and they have to um, explore a CTE option. And they're looking at partnering with Kent State University and offering something in theater. I think a CTE theater program with um, Kent State. So they were supposed to open this fall. I'm not sure now that they're going to have a new administration coming this fall if that's going to happen. But the goal is for all five schools, districts to offer some programs. And um, again, we're looking to expanding to some more school districts. But we're going to make sure we're offering various opportunities and we're expanding some more programs so you're going to hear about some additional programs that we're going to offer in our school district um, for students and those um, are listed those are listed in the powerpoint as well i just could, didn't go over those yeah okay you got them in powerpoint yeah. thank you or okay i'd just like to um, commend brad and you did say that you love cte and the year that you were away from that 100 percent you're back. I'm glad you're back. You're doing a phenomenal I'm glad job I'm with back you and your too. team, and we appreciate you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good. All right. Y'all are welcome to come visit Career Tech anytime. Yeah. Maybe that'll be my next walkthrough. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Brad. And the next thing on our agenda is our superintendent's report. So, Dr. Dixon. Okay, thank you. So, we're going to have our um, second reading of um, social studies curriculum. So, if we could have Karen Bauer Blazer come on up, please. Remember, last month uh, she was ill, so Bob mm -hmm. Swagger mm -hmm. did the first reading. So, she got a few she minutes to get her. Good evening, everybody. Thank you for waiting. Thank you for your patience. I'm here to update the uh, social studies proposal for adoption of textbooks for K through 12. My name is Karen Bauer Blazer. I've been at Cleveland Heights University High School District for 15 years, 13 years at the high school and social studies department. So this is my second year at this gig. So just to remind you of uh, what we're proposing uh, for K through six, we're proposing the use of the Ohio Weekly, uh, Ohio Social Studies Weekly magazine. For 4 through 11, so there's some overlap there, the Teachers Curriculum Institute History Alive program. For the AP classes at the high school, grades 10 through 12, a variety of publications, including Cengage, Pearson, and Bedford Worth. So this is what the continuum looks like. I think you saw that last, last month. So uh, what I'm going to do is address the questions that we pulled together last month 
And then if you have any further questions, please, please ask. So I, uh, one of the questions was what is new and what is not new? So in terms of uh, social studies, the high school teachers are pretty familiar with the program that's TCI. We've been using the world history, American history, and US government textbooks since 2013. Middle school teachers are somewhat familiar with it, and in fact, some of them have teacher subscriptions, but they did not have student texts, so they were kind of dabbling with it. And uh, none of the elementary school teachers have familiarity with uh, TCI. Um, but various teachers at various buildings have been using the Social Studies Weekly for the last few years. So, What is new is that all K through 6 classrooms will have the Social Studies Weekly. All 4 through 11 classrooms will have History Alive. We will have teacher professional development in August of this year as well as on our professional day uh, district-wide in November. And along with that, we'll be updating common assessments to reflect the new resources to align with our new state standards will be coming out for social studies. So they're in the process right now. So there, some of them are being um, gotten rid of, some are being rewritten, some are you know, in various stages. So we'll know about that uh, pretty soon. And then we also have uh, our district pacing guide that will have to be adapted to the new resources. Got a question about what language or languages are available with these publications. And Spanish is always uh, an option. But the beauty of Google is that now we can take a text uh, from just about any source and translate it. And so even for our Nepali students, they will have that ability to not only uh, hear it and they can see it in Nepali, they, you know, so if they can read Nepali, they'll be able to read their textbook, et cetera. It's a good thing. Got a question about the projection type for the um, National Geographic maps. Um, it's not the Mercator projection you may be more familiar with, but it's a modification of it. It's called Miller Syndrical Projection. I had to do a little digging on that one. But basically, the, the issue is when you try to turn a 3D thing like the world um, into a flat map, you're going to have some problems with distortion. So on the Mercator projection, if you look, the farther you get away from the equator, area becomes distorted. So if you look at Greenland, really isn't, you know, it appears to be very big, but it's really not. Same, same would be true of, say, the continent of, even the continent of Africa to the United States. There's still some distortion. But it won't matter as much with the continent maps, because we're just going to see the continent. The Mercator or the Miller is a little bit, leaves a little bit to, to be desired when you're trying to see the entire world. But that's not what those maps will be. They'll be continents only. And they're very familiar. Uh, well, they'll seem very familiar to the students when they see them. Got another question about how we will track the use of technology and the use of these new resources. This happens to be a screenshot of something that teachers will have with the Studies Weekly program, where you can see whether or not a student has ever logged in, how much time they've spent on it, what they've done, what they've accomplished, what they've scored. You can do both that with uh, you can do that with both Studies Weekly and History Alive. So teachers can track what's happening. Uh, we got an, uh, some questions about uh, our equity goal. And so I just wanted to point out that one of the standards for adoption of textbooks, as we're looking at them, is letter B, freedom from bias. Particularly important when you're talking about social studies resources. Um, we want to make sure that all people um, are, are part of the story. So um, something new to Ohio S Studies Weekly is the creation of a diversity board. And uh, for those of you who may be familiar with the Cleveland Metro School District, uh, Ms. Uh, Gail Gaddison is um, their social studies curriculum director. And she's been invited and is participating on the uh, diversity board for Studies Weekly. So they're reviewing all their curriculum. They've, in fact, they've done it already for bias. Um, 
Ohio Studies Weekly is being adopted by the state of California for their districts, and, and California has a FAIR Act that has to be complied with. So Studies Weekly just went through a review and uh, was found to be uh, representing people in appropriate ways. For History Alive, which is published by the Teachers Curriculum Institute, um, as a matter of course, equity issues are part of the uh, curriculum. Uh, they provide the story of history through multiple perspectives, and students are uh, encouraged to find their, find their own path. Uh, there is a review process that uh, the text undergoes, and they use not only historical scholars, but also community um, interest groups who weigh in on the representation of all people. So they really, um, I was talking to the national uh, rep, and you know, he said it's, it's an important goal for History Alive to make sure that the diversity of America is represented. Uh, once again, you saw this last month. These are the uh, proposed costs for the Studies Weekly. Uh, this is K through six for six years. This is the cost for class sets for all the students. Four through 11, they're um, TCI class sets. And for the AP courses, one-to-one -one students. So all three have print and online components. And um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback from people who've used it in the past, used them in the past. Uh, that's the adoption cycle. I think you're familiar with that. There was a question about what was being used. Oh, do you want to ask anything about social studies before I talk about the Spanish? Uh, question about the, uh, <clears throat> the print and online edition. Will every student receive uh, a, a print book, or will we use class sets and rely on the online edition? How, how will those um, decisions I be made? I think what we, what we landed on uh, were class sets and students who do not have online access at home will, be, will have the ability to sign out textbooks. Okay. So just the way we sign out books now, if we're giving everybody one book, this way we'll have. So we're, we're padding the class sets a little bit so that if five students need it, mm -hmm. they will have it. Karen, I didn't have a question, but I had a comment. And I wanted to thank whoever gave us the um, packet of samples of yeah. Yeah. So You're thank welcome. you very much. You're I enjoyed looking fun. at that, and it you know it made it real for me what what you guys were talking about. So thank you for You're taking the time to do that. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Okay. So on to Spanish. The current textbooks that are used are, as you can see, fairly aged. <laughs> um, 2005, 2005, and 2000. So they're they're going to be thrilled to uh, get new. Material. So as uh, a reminder from last month, these are the recommendations for adoption. And these are the proposed costs, six-year cost again for, for the uh, Spanish and uh, French. Any other questions? All right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So next we have Dr. Paul Lombardo with our, our new policy review committee. And we have our first reading of our policies with Dr. Lombardo. Brad, while they're getting set up, Mr. Collender. While they're getting set up, uh, you didn't mention to whom a donation would be made out and how that donation would be delivered for the trip uh, to the to the nationals. <laughs> we will happily accept all donations in my office, and you can direct them to my attention. So um, uh, I think we get other donations and, and other. Um, 
actually any any kind of funding or donation would come through my office. So if you want to, if, if anyone wants to make that donation, you can direct it to the finance office, uh, to my attention, and we'll make sure that Mr. Calder gets Check would be made out to? Uh, to Cleveland Heights University City School District. Got it. All right, well, good evening. Um, this is the first reading of some of our policies for review. I'm going to tell you a little bit about our process and our, our committee process. Um, we use what's called NEOLA uh, policy templates. Now, NEOLA used to stand for Northeast Ohio Learning Association, but because they deal with other states besides Northeast Ohio, they ju they're just NEOLA now, okay? Uh, and they provide school districts with complete service for developing and uplating board policies and bylaws. Uh, administrative guidelines, they do handbooks, staff parent handbooks, and they have electronic and printed forms. And they have over 750 superintendent and school boards, and they work out of, um, they work with school districts from Florida, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, Michigan, Wisconsin, and West Virginia. And what NEOLA does is they publish two regular updates per year. One will be in August, and then one in January. And then they do have some special updates that they'll send uh, to districts um, when appropriate. So you received in a Google folder um, later la or last week that contained some proposed changes in language. And uh, from NEOLA, which were edits that were from legal counsel from NEOLA, and also from our uh, policy review committee. Um, in your hard copy packet that you got last week, you'll, uh, you'll see our policy review committee and the members, and we try to organize a process so you can see what we've done throughout the last uh, couple months. So we met in February, we met in March, and we met in April to discuss 31 policies. Now we're not bringing you 31 policies today, obviously, and um, I know uh, Mrs. Serini um, did mention at the last board meeting that um, we we're going to break those up into three different parts. I thought it was a great idea. So you have seven of them today. And as we go through the next couple months, we'll be putting them on, a, there's three readings, we'll be putting them on different cycles. And I'll try to make sure that I put those as organized as possible for you so you know what the first reading is of, let's say, Group A, which I'm calling today, and then first group B and group C. But in your Google Doc, you'll see two copies. You'll see one with all the edits in a folder, and then you'll see one that's a clean version, and we will post the clean version on board docs. Because of all the edits, it just gets so confusing. Um, but you can go back to the Google Doc to see where those edits have come from. Most of those have come from legal, um, uh, based on the state or federal changes in laws they go ahead and update those templates and then they send them to us for review. So you do have seven board policies there. Um, looking at the hard copy in your, when you look at the uh, policy review committee checklist and summary, you'll see the policy number, which is on the left hand side. Uh, it'll either be new or revised. You'll see the section number and area expert. Um, because of our, um, our committee um, picks different policies that they, they had interest in and they wanted to research. We attached an area expert, which is either a director or assistant soup or someone in the district that deals with that on a daily basis, and they went and, and just double-checked the policy with those area experts. And then there's a person responsible, so those are the people that in the committee that wanted to take on that policy, and we worked either by ourselves or with groups. We didn't want to force anyone to take on a policy they weren't comfortable taking on, but everyone picked multiple policies to be a part of. And then you'll see the first reading for these policies is May 1st, the second reading will be June, and the third reading will be in July when you'll make that adoption. It's always on the third reading. Okay? So I hope that it, that uh, was organized for you and, and, and you can see what we did there. If you look at the summaries, we're also going to provide for you the reason for the change, and these also come from NEOLA as well as our committee. So you have a paragraph under each one of those that gives you why, um, what was changed in the law and what NEOLA recommends that a board does adopt. That corresponds with all the comments and the edits in your Google folder. 
I know. It, this is a. I know it, it can get kind of complicated, but um, and I wish it was as exciting as CT, because I mean, Brad, you're, I'm excited about policies, but um, I'm trying to spruce this up, you know. Bring us a bingo sheet. There's no trophy yeah, for no policies. <laughs> we'll do bingo, bing policy bingo next time, right? Policy Jeopardy, good. So I'll open it up if you have um, any questions over particular policies. Um, I can try to answer them. If I can't answer them, I will provide you answers. But I will open it up to the board if you have any questions or comments pertaining to any of the seven policies for the first reading. Uh, I've got a, a couple. OK. Um, in, in no particular order whatsoever. Uh, the. Um, policy related to the employment of substitute educational aides? Yes. Um, there's a line in the second paragraph, uh, the sent, well, it's really a sentence. It says, the superintendent shall employ substitute educational aides slash paraprofessionals for assignment as services are required to fill in for uh, temporary, temporarily absent regular staff members or to fill vacant positions in accordance with this policy. Okay. And I'm, I'm just, that, that last little piece just seems a little awkward to me. So if I'm, if you're on employment of substitute educational ages, are you on page one of two? I am on page one of two, the second uh, sentence slash paragraph. So such assignments of substitutes may be terminated when their services are no right longer required? Right then, yes. Uh, I guess I can't imagine what vacant positions this would be related to. Oh, these would be any of our paraprofessionals, one-on-one -on -one aides, um, people that may have resigned or new positions that come up um, okay. through IEPs and those types of things. We do try to uh, hire those as soon as possible. Okay. Um, if we can't find someone, let's say a one-on-one -on -one aide for a special circumstance, we can't put them in. It used to be five days. Now we can put them in for up to 60 days uh, prior to getting that aid permit. Okay. So it does give us some flexibility um, to do that. Uh, thank you. Sure. Uh, the next one is um, it's page two of two. But it doesn't seem to be related to the. Well, I'll tell you what, while I find that. The, the biggest uh, concerns that I have, and I think that they are actually concerns, is related to the Business Advisory Council. Okay, let me just get there. That's the final one. Mm -hmm. So the Business Advisory Council, um, the, I call it a preamble, um, which is sort of the description of the, of the policy and maybe the rationale for the policy. Um, <clears throat> And it, it says that the Board of Education recognizes the increasing importance of the nation's productivity and future well-being of its citizens that students enter the labor market with employable skills and attitudes. Um, the word attitudes gives me great pause because um, this language sounds quite a bit like the language that uh, surrounds Jobs Ohio. Um, and um, I just think that we as public schools do not exist to instill attitudes. I think that we are here to create citizens with a variety of attitudes. So I would encourage us to consider striking the word attitudes entirely unless we might add some local flavor to it and list a few attitudes that we would support. Um, so perhaps we could think about that. For cleanliness, probably striking the word entirely. Um, also, so this basically um, allows us to, um, f for uh, efficiency, uh, to join up with um, I'm assuming it's Cuyahoga County's ESC, although that's the, the, the that's specific the ESC isn't listed here. Right. Um, there's a blank spot. 
Um, for, for that one, we did not pick that as an option. So where you see the box with nothing in it, that's not going to be part of the policy recommendation. Oh, I see. Okay, very good. Very, very good. Um, so wh what business advisory council are we going to use? That I'm not certain of. Okay. Guess we have to get some information on that. Yeah. Um, and then I, I, before adopting anything related to the Business Advisory Council, I would personally appreciate a, a roster of the members of that Business Advisory Council just to make sure that um, the people at that table, um, you know, those, those companies, um, you know, share our values in equal work for equal pay, um, that those companies participate in their communities in a positive way. Um, I think that it's important that the Business Advisory Council has um, uh, organized labor represented at the table as well. So um, if we can have a roster of the members of those, that council uh, as we out. look to adopt, that would be great. All right, any other questions on the, any of the seven policies? Again, this is the first reading, so we'll have a couple times to do this. I have just a general comment. I spent a fair amount of time on the Google Docs trying to clean up the language so that things are less clunky. Thank you. Um, and they are very <laughs> clunky. But the broad concept is to, you know, lose the passive voice wherever possible get rid of the he, she stuff and, and just make it read more easily so that it's more comprehensible. I will tell you that Neola is yes. going through and doing that and they will be submitting it. They're doing it as they update each policy. So the version, so, the updates we get from them will be less horrendous than the ones we currently have? I can't promise that, but that is what <laughs> I was the told goal. by okay. the, Neo the Neola representative yeah. at um, the NSBA conference when I pigeonholed him and complained about the voice being different, you know. Yeah, there's inconsistencies so, yeah. even within the same policy that are just. Yep, <laughs> yep. Yeah. exactly. Okay. Great. Great, and if, uh, if you have any questions um, as you go through throughout the weeks, please just uh, send them to me in an email. I'll research those for you and I'll bring them back um, for the next reading. Thank you. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any other more questions for Paul? No. Okay. okay, thank you. Do you have anything else for the superintendent's report? No. All right, then we will move on to the treasurer's report. Mr. Gaynor. Uh, we have a uh, five year forecast uh, under the treasurer's report tonight. Um, I'll just note that this forecast is, is the same as the one that was, um, was passed last month. So there are no changes yet. Um, as we've discussed previously, you're going to see some significant changes in the coming months as we close the fiscal year, as we um, uh, finish with the collection of property taxes, and also as you approve staffing, you're going to see some, uh, some changes to those. So I think one of the frustrations and, and why I'm glad the board has asked to see the five-year forecast every month rather than just the statutorily required October and May is that treasurers get frustrated because October and May really are not the most meaningful times to see those documents <laughs> right. because you know, so many things year. happen after May yeah. mm -hmm. um, and actually December and, and uh, July would be better. Uh, so what we will do is, um, we, although we do have to submit the forecast in October and May to ODE, um, as those changes happen, we generally do another submission because you can submit as often as you choose. You're just obligated to do it in, in October and May. Um, we do submit updated forecasts to uh, ODE when there are substantive changes. So, so we generally do another uh, submission in July, you know, as a matter of course. So, unless there are any any, of, any questions, nothing has changed from the last one. I will note uh, um, again um, 
for Mr. Hines' benefit, the, the eight and a half million dollars is there, you know, uh, this, so there haven't been any changes to that yet. Um, there may be some slight changes before the end of the year, but it shouldn't uh, change much from the fact that eight and a half million dollars uh, in voucher dollars are leaving our district this year. Any further questions for Mr. Gaynor? Okay. We'll move on to the board president's report. Oh, we do need to approve it, even though it's the same one. Okay, we need to approve the uh, five-year forecast. So, Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Oh, I need a motion. So, can I get a motion to call the roll? I motion that we accept the five-year forecast. I second the motion. Thank you. Mr. Gaynor, call the roll. Mm -hmm. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Ms. Ray? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serene? Yes. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on to the board president report. Uh, Mr. Posh is not here, so there is no board president report. However, I would like to um, make a comment. Just, I'm sure if he were here, he would say this. In the business services section under G, we received several donations, and I would just like to thank the um, kind citizens who have made the donations to us, and we always appreciate that. So moving on from that, we will go on to, is there any unfinished business? No. Okay, moving on, is there any new business we need to discuss? Um, I would like to throw out there that the Memorial Day Parade is coming up soon, mm -hmm. and we as a board have not yet applied to march. So I'd like to just, are we going to march as a board, and do I need to fill out the application form? Caroline is filling out the application form for us. Okay. Yeah, Fabulous. I talked to her today about it, because I got it too, that we didn't have it. Okay, um, terrific. At some point, we need to decide what we're going to do, or is that a discussion you want Jim and I to figure it out? I will happily do anything, but I think we should all just be there and have fun. I second that. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Wright, you're out of town. Okay. Oh. But you're okay if the rest of us oh, do it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. I've been for several years. So. Great. It's fun. You enjoy it. Great. I know Jim and I talked about um, not renting cars and just walking. And Dan had made the wonderful <laughs> suggestion that we use one of our public is all banners. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And Caroline made the suggestion when I asked her about filling out the form today, maybe we could get someone to dress in the tiger um, <laughs> mascot. Not one of <laughs> us, but I, another person <laughs> to dress and accompany us as we are handing out candy and oh, that's whatnot. Cool. Yeah. So, great. So, thank you for bringing that. Good. Yeah. It'll be hot, probably. It'll be hot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Malia, for bringing that up. I don't think we need to vote on it. We, it's not something that's official, official business. Do we have any um, board committee reports? CTE hasn't met, BAC has not met. The uh, Heights Coalition for Public Education met uh, last week, and um, one of the items that we discussed is the importance uh, for the district to continue its engagement with Real Choice Ohio. Uh, Real Choice Ohio is, um, they had scheduled a conference that we, uh, we shared the flyer for, that conference has been moved, so hopefully we, the district will be represented when the conference does, uh, does happen. It's a wonderful organization that's uh, closely aligned with many of our goals. Great. Any idea when that conference will be? I don't have it offhand, but... Uh, okay. mid Sorry? Yeah, September. And then the only other board committee report I have is that the evaluation committee had a first initial meeting and we will be getting um, yes. together with Dr. Dixon and Scott Gaynor to at least just discuss kind of the direction we're going. So, Ms. Wright, any? No reports. Okay. 
So moving right along, do we have any correspondence and announcements? I have a couple announcements. Um, Boulevard Elementary School uh, just received its official STEM designation from nice. Excellent. the state, I guess. Um, so that's happy. And then uh, the other is just uh, that the Peace Playground cleanup will be happening on the 12th of May. Excellent. And that is usually a big community event and a bit of a party. Great. You know, um, similarly, I think it's worth noting that we, um, we hosted a community forum at the middle school uh, a week or so ago that um, I thought just went over so very well. Um, members of the community came and we had wonderful conversations and it was a very, very productive, positive evening. Um, so I just wanted to recognize that, thank um, the members of the staff administration and most importantly the community. Boy, there were some amazing young people there uh, who were sharing their ideas um, with us as well. It was a really a wonderful example of, it really was to me, the um, IB lifestyle in, in full swing. It was, it was a great evening. Any other announcements? Friday. Say again? Friday. Oh, the oh, alumni? Yes, and how. Right. Uh, yes, this coming Friday we have the Distinguished Alumni Hall of Fame induction ceremonies uh, here in this beautiful building. Um, we have uh, such a breadth of uh, extraordinary uh, alumni, um, people in child development. We've got um, couple of football players people have heard of. Um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a fantastic evening and a wonderful opportunity for this, the community to celebrate uh, the accomplishments of our graduates. And if you haven't had a chance to get to the library to see the art show, I would encourage yes. people to stop there. It is fantastic yeah, like it is every year. It is one of my favorite things is going to the library and seeing the art show. Yeah. All right. If there are no more announcements, I will ask if there is a motion to close the meeting. I will always motion to close the meeting. <laughs> Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Gaynor, will you call the roll? Ms. Wright? Yes. Mr. Hines? Yes. Ms. Serini? Yes. Ms. Lewis? Yes. Thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs> <laughs>